back. You're watching the India Development Debate with me, Ned Tara Rai. Today, we're talking about this deadly cyclone Fani, 175 kilometers an hour when it made its arrival in Urissa. But the evacuation process has indeed been very successful. Over 1 million people evacuated. India has weathered cyclone Fani with success. I'd like to now invite my panelists for today's debate. We're being joined by K. Srinath Reddy, the President of the Public Health Foundation of India, S.N. Pradhan, the DG at the National Disaster Response Force, Sasi Kumar Adhidamu, the Chief Technical Officer at Bajaj Alliance General Insurance. Thank you everyone for joining us here on the India Development Debate on ET Now. So Pradhan, if I could come to you first, you know, a fantastic effort by the National Disaster uh, Response Force. A lot is being talked about what you have been able to achieve, how you've been able to mitigate the risk. Uh, and there was so much that was being feared. Sir, can you share with us uh, how this has been done, the kind of coordination that would have required, you know, when, the la when we did see the cyclone make its uh, arrival in Urisa, we were talking about wind speeds of 175 kilometers an hour. The, highest ever evacuation process, one million lives saved. Well, uh, I, would, I would like to first of all place on record uh, my absolute uh, admiration for the, uh, the prediction that was made by the Indian Meteorological Department, which was absolutely spot on in every respect. They got, uh, got it right when they said that it will land near Puri. They got it right when they said that this is the time at which it will land and uh, they got the wind speed right and that is absolutely brilliant. And that gave us uh, almost uh, 48 hours plus, almost 72 hours lead time to prepare and uh, we latched on to that preparation time and uh, I must say that the government of India uh, at the highest level took a very proactive step and decided to monitor the whole situation right from the prediction point. And then the cabinet secretary started holding uh, regular meetings uh, of the uh, crisis management committee, of which NDRF is a part. And then it was uh, it was uh, very well planned and very well uh, you know uh, uh, strategized, so that uh, it was then easy for us to then follow up. And that's what uh, we did in NDRF. And the NDRF, for its uh, part, uh, we contacted the state government. Uh, worked out exact the uh, exact placements of uh, uh, the pre-positioning teams, and uh, I am very happy to share that uh, we could put our teams in place 48 hours in advance uh, before the cyclone made a landfall, and that was critical because when the 10 million uh, sorry the 1 million people were evacuated ultimately, the evacuation happened after a lot of uh, lot of uh, persuasion. And the persuasion time was required and had it been uh, too tight uh, a timeline it would have been difficult to persuade and also to move them. So the persuasion uh, time uh, uh, was utilized very well and finally on the second day, uh, the second half of the second day we could start moving the people. Of course the state administration took a lead in that and the NDRF uh, was handholding the whole process. But that was probably the, the master stroke if I may say because when 1 million plus people are evacuated well in advance and they are into safer areas and cyclone shelters and they are also well provided, uh, I think half the job is done. Of course, with the nature you cannot take a chance and it could have been very, very uh, devasta devastating. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, devastation in terms of the uprooting of trees and the snapping of power lines and telecom lines, uh, in, uh, especially in Puri and uh, Bhuvneshwar also. But then overall I think, uh, I think uh, it could have been much worse and uh, I think the preparation has, uh, has uh, borne fruit and uh, I, would, I, I'm, I would be reasonably satisfied with what has transpired. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to come back to you. We want, really want to know more about that evacuation process. And you, know, you just referred to that uh, master stroke, which is something now I'd like to talk to Mr. Reddy about. A master stroke, evacuation of a million people. But, you know, the rehabilitation process, uh, that's when, you know, the real difficulty, the next challenge also starts. Waterborne diseases, uh, you know, it could come with mosquito bites, snake bites, all of that. And we've seen it in the past. Uh, you know, we also interviewed the health secretary and she came out with her suggestions on uh, how to make sure that the rehabilitation is also safe and, uh, uh, you know, disease-free. 
If you could share with the ET now viewers who are watching you, all the people who are in those three affected states, what must keep on top of mind to stay disease free, uh, to actually be totally safe from this cyclone? Well, firstly, the evacuation has been a very remarkable process. And now in the camps and the shelters where now people are being given refuge, we need to ensure that there is no outbreak of infectious diseases. Uh, we need to ensure water quality, adequacy of food, with uh, ensuring that the food is also not contaminated. We must be particularly attentive to the fact that there will be children, elderly people, disabled people and people who may be harboring some infectious diseases or susceptible to them and in a crowded environment you could easily have outbreaks for example if some children have not been vaccinated against measles there could be measles outbreaks but also we must recognize that there are people who are likely to be on long term medication whether it's tuberculosis or diabetes or hypertension and their medical supplies have been disrupted so we need to ensure that their chronic continuous care is maintained. And of course, as has been pointed out earlier, trauma is a major challenge. And for people who might have obtained injuries from uh, trees or collapsed buildings or flying debris, we need to ensure that from minor injuries to major trauma, we can provide the kind of care that is required. And here it is absolutely mandatory not only for public health care facilities but for private health care facilities also to step in and provide the kind of care that's required. Uh, then we need to also make sure that people's mental health which is now under great strain is also attended to with adequate counseling techniques. And uh, for people who require immunization whether it is for tetanus, for injuries, or other types of immunization we need to provide that but ensuring medical supplies and emergency care alongside acute care and chronic continuous care is going to be very important indeed and uh, for this we need to have not merely doctors but a large number of allied health professionals and paramedics and even community health workers who are trained uh, to be available to provide these kind of services and as people move back into their homes uh, we must make sure again firstly uh, that uh, rodents and snakes uh, that have sought shelter from the floods are no longer posing a threat uh, rodents from leptospirosis and uh, such infections and snakes of course from snake bites uh, we must also ensure that carcasses of animals which have died in the flood uh, are again not posing a threat to human health and garbage disposal and sanitation becomes a very very important priority indeed uh, and we must also encourage people to avoid stagnant water, to bail out the water as quickly as possible because stagnant water breeds mosquitoes and um, apart from malaria, dengue can also set in later on. So many of these conditions are eminently preventable and I must actually say that in a previous cyclone some years ago which Odisha experienced, the state government had handled it remarkably well and it had become a role model and now Kerala and Odisha are the role models for disaster management. And now Kerala and Odisha are the role models for disaster management. Okay, so they are indeed the role models when it's coming in. You know, it's so obvious with that, uh, like I said, just rewind a few years ago to Tamil Nadu and look what happened then. Look what we are seeing today in Urisa. Uh, it is very uh, uh, heartwarming to see that. Mr. Ramesh, if I could come to you, you've played and the IMD has played a crucial role in this, getting it right, getting the warning out in time, lives running into hundreds and thousands, if not lakhs, have been saved because of the Met Department's prediction. So the reason we got you today on the India Development Debate uh, was A, to congratulate you, but secondly, to also get the latest update on Cyclone Fawny. We understand it has weakened, but if you could share with us what is expected over the next couple of hours. Uh, what is the latest update that you can share with us? Now the cyclone has weakened marginally to a stage of a very severe cyclonic storm uh, and then uh, still it possesses a lot of damaging potential uh, to the tune of 130 kilometers per hour on an average uh, it is uh, uh, possessing 
and then uh, along with that it has got so much of rain uh, uh, bearing uh, potential for last every 3 hours uh, to the tune of 10 to 15 centimeters of rainfall uh, is happening all across its trajectory and uh, in advance uh, also Bengal started getting rainfall uh, right from the morning not of very high intensity but continuously moderate intensity rainfall is happening over uh, uh, up to middle uh, Bengal uh, West Bengal districts and added uh, misery to this uh, scenario is lot of uh, uh, storm water uh, inundation inland inundation by the storm surge high wave action tiding, tidal action is uh, uh, creating lot of coastal inundation and coastal flooding and lot of rain pouring on the land also adding to the um, flooding scenario in several towns and villages so many rivers are there they are taking uh, sea water so much inland into that damage some of the uh, small culverts and bridges uh, con constructed some canal uh, uh, systems also will be get affected very badly those are some of the things they will continue to happen and they are continue to happening okay. uh, now but in coming two three hours by, by maybe by 10 o'clock or so system okay. will intensify into a uh, severe cyclonic storm level and then perhaps uh, it will uh, uh, enter West Bengal sometime okay. around midnight Okay, so around midnight is when it will uh, hit West Bengal, but it is weakening. Uh, having said that, if I could now go across to Sasi Kumar Adidamo, uh, can you share with us the role the insurance sector at large is playing? You're going to have to play a very crucial role, rehabilitation, uh, that costs a lot of money. We have seen, you know, insurance is of course very badly penetrated all over India, but having said that, uh, lessons have been learned from the past. Uh, the insurance industry has stepped up. We have seen certain policies that come out for uh, natu natural disasters and calamities. What is the role of the insurance industry and, you know, do the people in these three states need to worry? Uh, will their premiums go up? Will the insurance companies pay up? Yeah. Uh, uh, I think the point you have raised is very, very important. Insurance uh, as an industry has a very big role to play when we come across and facing such a huge natural calamity. So, uh, of late, if you see in the last few years, so these natural calamities which used to be for now will be happening once in 5 to 10 years. They started happening once in 2 years. The frequency has also gone up. But unfortunately, still the insurance penetration is at such a dismal level where we have been uh, watching uh, the insured losses hardly accounting for maybe around max 15% of the overall economic losses. So, insurance industry is ready to uh, to provide the financial shame for whoever is losing the money. But the very penetration levels are so low, the ability of the insurance industry as a whole to take care of these uh, uh, disasters is limited to 15 to 16 percent. That's uh, my first point. Getting back to, to uh, other angles, what sort of you know, you know claims we see, like for example, you look at uh, Kerala. So the overall insured losses are around 2,000 crores. I look at Chennai floods, so the overall losses for, for the insurance industry are around 3,500 crores. But beyond this, because of lack of awareness, because of lack of penetration, there is huge amount of uninsured losses. So that is very, very unfortunate. Okay. So I'll come back to you for the projections that uh, that it could be. Uh, but General Pradhan, I want to come to you now. You know, you obviously have information from the Met Department. Uh, Mr. Ramesh has just uh, shared with us the latest when it comes to Andhra Pradesh, West Bengal, and the status of Cyclone Fani. Can you now share with us the preparations that are being made of West Bengal as well as Andhra Pradesh? Well, I think the uh, the uh, uh, the worst part, uh, uh, worst, worst phase for the Andhra Pradesh uh, state is uh, uh, done and dusted. I would say uh, the cyclone has also uh, passed by uh, the center of the uh, Orissa bulge, uh, which bulges out into the Bay of Bengal. And now uh, it will, as uh, Mr. Ramesh was saying, it will come out somewhere uh, above uh, Balasore and enter West Bengal probably uh, late in the uh, night today. Uh, we have uh, placed uh, 18 uh, NDRF teams in West Bengal, as was the case in uh, in uh, Andhra Pradesh. 
uh, Orissa of course had uh, the had to bear the brunt, so it had 38 uh, NDRF teams. But uh, there are 18 teams in West Bengal, and uh, as we are anticipating a much less level of gust wind, which is which is of course not uh, less in terms in absolute terms, because anything uh, nearly 100 is bad enough. But uh, I think the preparations have started well in advance, and NDRF has coordinated with the uh, state administration, the Disaster Management Authority. Uh, for the last four or five days, there have been meetings, and the Chief Secretary has chaired the meeting, uh, I think, yesterday. And uh, I believe the Chief Minister is uh, camped in uh, Kharagpur. And uh, all the precautions have been taken by the uh, by the local administration of uh, the seven or eight districts that are uh, uh, in the impact zone. So. Uh, Combined with the NDRF's preparations, I would I would anticipate that uh, uh, despite the, the issue of flooding, which is very 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 real, I would say that uh, the uh, impact from the winds uh, should be not so damaging in West Bengal. But having said that, I would uh, I would I would say, which I have already messaged to my teams across the three states, that now the real work begins because now the now the phase of restoration and relief and uh, rescue. And all these three R's are very, very important because uh, this is the real response. The response, of course, starts with the hitting of the uh, landfall, but then the relief, uh, rescue and rehab is what is very, very important. And that is where NDRF will have to do the hand-holding. Right now, we are trying to get Bhuvneshwar as the capital city of Orissa up to speed by uh, removing the roadblocks which are all around and uh, the restoration of power lines etc whatever NDRF can do is doing and uh, that is not the case in Andhra Pradesh where there has neither been a loss of life except that there have been some trees on the roads and there have been some snapping of power lines which have been very rapidly restored because the storm surge was not so bad in Andhra Pradesh in Odisha it was it was bad so uh, the there is the work is cut out but then uh, as far as Bengal is concerned I would I would say the uh, impact should be comparatively much less. So if I go, before I go on to the others, I want to, I had a follow-up question for you, and that is the government spokesperson from the PIB has tweeted as per telephonic information in Puri, extensive damages to kacha houses, old buildings and temporary shops. No confirmed reports of deaths, but 160 reportedly injured. Power and telecom is completely down. The NDRF and state forces are clearing the roads. Something you also just talked about as far as roadblocks, etc. go. So can you share with us like, then how are people who are in trouble supposed to get in touch? Because uh, whether it's the center or the state or the railways, there are all these helplines. But what is the point of these helplines or these uh, fax numbers, etc. if they cannot be used? Do you have any information from the telecom companies that say, let's say, uh, that talk about when all of this will be up and running? Well, the, when the telephone line is mentioned, I think they are meaning here the BSNL mostly and the uh, and the landlines. The uh, some of the service providers are uh, working. Uh, of course, it's sporadic because I am in touch with most of my teams and they are using different service providers and they are also allowing people to talk on the same phone. So obviously, the, it it has to be a, a kind of a, a, a combined effort. We are also uh, uh, we have uh, uh, emergency operation centers at uh, lower levels below the district level also and wherever the NDRF or other forces are there we are also uh, opening the channels of uh, in even the wireless channels and other channels to uh, make information available to people who are concerned so it is not as if it is it is not as if there's a total communication blackout there is some amount of some semblance of communication and uh, um, I'm sure uh, before long the more more channels will also open up it is a it is a it is a difficult situation no doubt and I'm not trying to undermine that and when a cyclone of this speed hits it can damage uh, uh, cause damage to communication lines in any part of the world the best communication uh, grids can be damaged but we have to respond back and uh, and uh, kind of uh, bounce back faster and that is where the litmus test lies and that is what we are trying to do let go back to Mr. Reddy now uh, you know, sir, you talked about what a tall task lies ahead. You just heard how uh, General Pradhan has also outlined that for us. You've told us what the immediate risks are. You also called upon how there is need for allied staff to be accompanying the doctors. Uh, the health secretary, Preeti Sudhan, did tell us about the various teams that are deployed. Um, in your assessment, sir, you know, when do you, like, 
when do you think is going to be safe for the doctors and nurses, the allied staff to enter these states for the actual rehabilitation and to ensure uh, that there is no sp uh, widespread uh, of diseases? Well, I think doctors and allied health professionals are already on the scene because they are proceeding alongside the rescue operation into the camps and even in the homes aware of people who are affected. So, uh, if, for example, if there is a trauma, then people need to be attended to even on the spot and uh, during transport. So, I think the need for medical services starts immediately and of course, the nature of medical services that need to be provided will change over time as people move away from the immediate aftermath of the cyclone into later infectious disease outbreaks which we hope will be prevented fully or even the aftermath of some of the injuries and uh, mental health effects. Uh, right now I think the health system is also fully geared up to provide this wide range of responses. In fact our own Indian Institute of Public Health in Bhuvaneshwar had 33 medical officers in training from the state government in a diploma in public health management. They have all now been deployed across the state uh, to tr try and r help in running of these services. And uh, I think the entire health workforce of the government is now fully galvanized into providing a uh, full range of services. So I think uh, from the point of view of uh, the medical response and the public health response they are already on. Uh, only thing is the nature of conditions that require to be attended to will change over a period of time. point that you made over there and you know very useful information uh, for all of our viewers and all of those that might be in those three states. So Ramesh if I could now come to you. Uh, you have told us what the pr prediction and the forecast in the next couple of hours is. Uh, what is the IMD's projection by when uh, uh, Cyclone Fani will leave uh, uh, the shores of India, will actually leave India? What is the projection to that? By when will it be completely safe you think? Yeah, tomorrow if the afternoon uh, it should weaken into a cyclonic storm and perhaps into deep depression then enter uh, the northwestern Bangladesh uh, on 5th uh, and by afternoon it will go enter Bangladesh by 5th evening or 5th afternoon it should go to our uh, uh, Meghalaya hills and then uh, dissipate altogether uh, somewhere there in Assam on 5th. So, by the 5th, we will have, uh, it will be normal condition is in a nutshell is what you are saying. Yeah, by by 5th morning, uh, I suppose, uh, rainfall activity and all this disturbed stormy weather and everything should vanish from uh, Bengal and uh, Orissa altogether. You know, I'm running out of time, but uh, General Pradhan, if I could just come to you for final comments. You know, the, the, the cyclone is also in the midst of elections. Now, while the election commission has uh, uh, decided to, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, work around cyclone funny, I really had no choice. Having said that, uh, your job on the 6th is also perhaps going to be crucial when we see a lot of the seats go to vote. Are you prepared for that? What are the kind of preparations that are being made? Are you involved in that? No, no, NDRF is not involved. NDRF as a force is not uh, involved in the election process at all. They are exempted from the uh, election process because they are by nature a disaster and an emergency management force. So we are, uh, we are clear from that. So we will be focusing on the uh, task at hand which is the uh, disaster response. And I'm sure, uh, as I said, the Bengal uh, situation is uh, qualitatively different from the Odisha situation. And I hope that uh, it will be uh, relatively... Uh, relatively uh, reasonably safer to come out of it and uh, probably that, that is what I am anticipating. 
Okay, with that, uh, General Pradhan, I'd like to thank you for taking the time out, joining us here on ET Now. I think it's a big thank you from the people of India for everything that the NDRF has done uh, to keep the people of uh, Odisha particularly safe and also in Andhra Pradesh as well as West Bengal. I'd like to thank my other panelists as well. We're completely out of time. Uh, you know, we have been able to brave Cyclone Fani right from the front and as we can see the evacuation process is something that we should all take heart from. Many thanks for watching.